Akram Elias, past Grand Master of Washington, D.C., and I welcome you all to this exciting conversation on Freemasonry, civics, and civic engagement with Oscar winner and brother Richard Dreyfus. Brother Dreyfus joined the Society of Free and Accepted Masons in Washington, D.C. 10 years ago in 2011. He is a member of my mother lodge, Potomac Lodge Number no. 5. Hey, it is the lodge that Dan Brown highlighted in his novel, The Lost Symbol. And Brother Richard became a 32nd degree Freemason in Washington, D.C. And we have with us the SGIG of our Scottish Rite, Brother Len Proden, present with us uh, in this program. Brother Len, would you like to say a few words of welcome? Yes, thank you. And on behalf of the Valley of Washington and the membership team of the House of the Temple, all here in our nation's capital, I would like to welcome all of our brother Masons around our country, as well as especially our Scottish Rite brethren from the Northern Masonic jurisdiction. Our purpose tonight, of course, is civics and civic engagement, but it's really to provide a learning activity in celebration of Constitution Day. And that was, of course, 234 four years ago when 39 men signed that special document that gave us the blessings of freedom. Now, I would like to just personally say about Brother Dreyfus, I'm sort of forgettable and he may not remember me, but in 2011, civics and civic engagement was nothing new to him. He had surveyed curricula of various public schools, and he was, of course, really energetic in trying to establish some type of activity with civics in our public school system. And at that time, he did let then Grand Commander Ronald A. Seal, as well as myself, know how this was going to work. So this civic and civic engagement is nothing new to him. And I'm certainly glad that he's with us tonight. And I would say back to you, Akram. Well, thank you, Len. Uh, and uh, also joining us uh, for this conversation with Brother Richard are six uh, other Freemasons, all associated with the Masonic Legacy Society, whose aim is to unleash the transformative power of Freemasonry by accelerating the awakening of as many Freemasons as possible around the United States and the world. To that end, Following a series of workshops held over three years with the support of the John E. Fetzer Memorial Trust, no longer in existence, we produced a document and a facilitation guide that you can download in several languages at Masonic Legacy Society 2026.com or simply MLS2026.com. My brethren, our goal for today's program is to have Brother Richard's own journey and perspective on civics and civic engagement energize you and make you seriously reflect on how you can do your part as free builders at this most crucial time in the history of our country and that of humanity. With that said, let me share with you a couple of thoughts about Richard Dreyfus, not the actor and Oscar winner, but the man committed to the ideals of the Enlightenment. I first met Richard 21 years ago to discuss a film project. I had already written the treatment for the documentary in which I explained the great experiment using the hidden symbolism of Washington DC's landmarks, monuments, and memorials. Now within a few minutes of our first conversation, he said, and I'm quoting, do you realize the importance of this effort? You of Arab tradition and I of Jewish tradition are coming together, united by the powerful idea of America to tell the world what the great experiment is all about. I love this stuff, let's do it. I never forget that. Well, we could produce the documentary titled Mr. Dreyfus Goes to Washington and delivered it to the History Channel on September 10th, 2001, one day prior to 
The two hour film premiered nationwide on Thanksgiving Day, 2001. We also produced a 37 minute educational version that was broadcast by the History Channel to more than 80,000 80, schools across the country. My brethren, six days ago, on the occasion of the 20th anniversary of 9-11, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin stated, and I quote, we do know the only compass that can guide us through the storms ahead. It is our core values and principles enshrined in our constitution. He then went on to say, and I quote, it is our job to defend the great experiment that is America, to protect this exceptional republic, body and soul, even when it is hard, especially when it is hard. So brother Richard, now I'm coming to you echoing the words of Secretary Austin, it seems indeed very hard today to protect this exceptional republic. I know that you are trying to do your part. So please take a few moments to share with us your passion for civics and tell us about your upcoming book. And listen to this, listen to the title, The Return to Common Senselessness. Quite intriguing. Brother Richard, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you. I am a person who has been reading American history since I was eight years old um, and surrounding that with Mongol history and Chinese history and whatever history you got. In 1991, I made a speech to the American Magazine Editors Conference, which had every editor from every magazine, from Vanity Fair and, the, and New Yorker, to people and us. And I said that something has happened in the country which cannot be named, but is the worst thing that has ever happened to us. And I went on to describe this uh, lack of national spirit, this lack of understanding our birthright. And then I realized as I spoke what it was. I spoke for an hour and 15 minutes. No one got up and went to the bathroom. It is known as the most uh, asked for speech in the history of that organization. And I spoke between, sandwich between uh, Storm and Norman and, and General Powell. I spoke to every editor in America and told them that we had done that which we never ever thought we would do, which is to break our oath, to teach our progeny the principles of our revolution, which we had done successfully and removed it from every uh, school district in the country within a 10 year span. And it was gone by 1986. Um, I did not even begin to enumerate my anxiety until after the turn of the century. And I was having at that time what could only be nightmares from, from my higher power because I saw my grandchildren and they were looking at me and my daughter and saying, how could you have abandoned us like this? And I would wake up weeping. So it was a relatively easy thing to do to quit the film business and go to Oxford. I never wanted to be a celebrity with a cause. That made me terribly uncomfortable. And so I wanted to back myself up. I never thought that I would have to write the book I thought, I expected that someone else more knowledgeable or more uh, a better writer than I would do it until Atlantic Monthly had a series called Is Democracy Dying? 11 authors responded and everyone got it wrong. Everyone. And 
what we've not done is to teach our children what the revolutionary doctrine was that so frightened the world. We fired the king and aristocracy for fraud and we spread sovereign power to the common people. And the Masonic ideal is actually America in little. It's a metaphor for what we were. It's a metaphor for what we fought for. And when I discovered Akram, I discovered that the Masonic principles reflect exactly what the founders were seeking. Now, I'm coming out with the book and it is called The Return to Senselessness because senselessness was the ruling truth of this world from the beginning before Ur and Mesopotamia up until 1776. It was the only thing that all empires and nations agreed to. And they could say, you are a serf and your grandchildren will be serfs and my boot will always be on your neck. And that was the only truth agreed to by all nations and states. And America was founded in the teeth of that. It was a declaration of war against all of that thinking. And now there's a group that's always been there, a, a secret waiting to be unlocked. And that's the Masonic lodges. There's nothing in the Masons that need to be secret. It's simply, it needs the quiet that happens when people stop talking and they can listen to themselves and listen to others. We have no sense that we have invented anything. And yet we have and did. And we must have civics taught to our young, not university. The founders laughed at that idea. It must be taught to our young, even as glory tales and mythology. And then strictly every year from the fourth grade on, it must be taught with a Socratic dialogue between teachers and students in every class, not civic classes, every class, biology and everything else. And that way, you know that you are developing the skills and talents of communication, which are necessary as Masons and necessary as citizens. That is the Dreyfus Initiative in Little. Brother Richard, Brother Robert Johnson, you know, who's uh, joining us, uh, you know, from Illinois and has uh, a nationwide uh, radio podcast called WCY podcast or Whence Came You podcast. Sounds familiar. Please build on this whole civics. Thank you very much, Brother Richard. This is uh, absolutely incredible. Um, you know, I followed your push for civics education for a while now, and there's so much confusion today about the topic in the public realm and for you masonry uh, in the same manner. Uh, it's in the same boat. In fact, oftentimes it seems Freemasons really avoid the topic of civics because they equate it directly to politics, the latter of which is uh, really not to be discussed in a lodge room. And I would love to clear this up. What is the difference between civics and politics? Well, politics is actually the exercise of power. It's the exercise of the attainment of power. Civics is the ability to communicate with utter clarity and reason. The logic of a Republican democracy and the necessity of teaching it to our young so that they can put into practice these talents of communication and civility to their young and those around them. It has nothing to do 
with politics per se, it has to do with learning to be good neighbors and learning to be responsible for the other sectors of society. Thank you, Brother, uh, brother Richard. Um, also with us today is uh, Brother Dago Rodriguez. Uh, brother Dago is the chief editor of the Fraternal Review magazine uh, of the Southern California Masonic Research Society. Brother Dago, the floor is yours. Good evening, Brother Dreyfus. Good evening. In today's day and age, the, the, the truth seems to be manipulated bent and stretched to serve the agenda of one side over another, especially in social media. Personalization.com reports that there are nearly 3.5 billion active social media users and every 6.4 seconds, a new account has been created. We spend about 142 minutes on social media every single day with the average smartphone user operating at least seven social media accounts. Agility Solutions reports that more than 54% of teens get their news from social media outlets. Just like the character that you played in Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Roy Neary, who obsessed to search for the truth, how, in an era of information overload, can an individual best, best discern the truth? First, uh, I wanna thank you for that. And I, if, I, if I get on some T's crossed incorrectly or eyes dotted incorrectly, that's my fault. But what you just asked me, I can answer. We are always lagging behind once we discover a technology and fall in love with it. We don't even consider its negative aspects until later. And no one understood that cell phones, for instance, um, did not require you to raise your voice. That we had 150 years of talking into a cupped telephone and that taught us we didn't have to, but we didn't listen. And so there were fights in Starbucks and road rage. And it took a long time for people to settle down with a, with a technology that unfortunately ended up here in the cheek. And we didn't know enough to transfer that knowledge. We are always lagging behind and one thing it took us forever to understand, and we're still coming to grips with it, is that television is a hypnotic. And it, you first buy it because it fits very well into the furniture of your home. And then you turn it on. And when you turn it on, you go into a trance. And it's so powerful that in the first generation, parents left their kids right in front of the TV without a, a babysitter because they were absolutely focused on that television set. 10 years of that created a distortion of what was important in the world. If it wasn't on television, it wasn't important. And of course, that meant it could actually beat in importance the education that you got about the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And so those kids in, in the 50s grew up to be the school board members of the early 1970s. And they saw the 60s as the worst disaster in our history. They saw it that way because they saw it that way on television and TV through 12 years of education out the window. And what they saw on the box was far, far more important. I think that if you asked any secretary of education what the purpose of public education was, they would all get the answer wrong. The simple answer is public education turns students into active citizens and active citizens are the sovereignty of the people that we lean on. We gifted the poor of this world with having the brains and we sided with their potential. We were sick of the old ways and we wanted a new thing. And the poor of the world 
responded by creating the largest, longest mass movement voluntary of human beings in the history of the world. It is something that had never stopped and would be going on right now uh, if the government hadn't stepped in. That is the, the easiest thing that they did, and the easiest thing that we pronounced to them. We said, you can have more freedom, more liberty, more comprehensive power with a basic education rather than be treated like the cattle that they have been treated like for 7,000 years. And from 1776 on, we proved it. That's what we did here in a secular way. And of course, that first generation were taught by Scottish professors who were teaching the Enlightenment and the Masonic ideals. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, um, uh, Richard, Brother Richard. And we're also, we have with us uh, Brother Baruti Kemet Sisuba. He is the director of the Transcendental Meditation Program in Cambridge, Massachusetts the home of Harvard University with the first academic Masonic Lodge in the United States. Brother Baruti. Thank you, Brother Akram. Uh, Brother Richard, at present, I'm working on a project with the Massachusetts Lodge of Research where the goal is to explore a fundamental question. In short, we're asking the question, where were the good Masons during the darkest times in our country's history? With this in mind, and for the benefit of future generations of researchers on the current zeitgeist, be they Masonic or otherwise, will you share a few thoughts with our Masonic audience on what each of us can do to further the cause of unity in our communities, irrespective of one's political affiliation? Yes, I can. And I would say Masonic, uh, Masonic principles were kept quiet during the run up to the Civil War because everyone was afraid that the ideals of masonry would, would take second place to those um, thoughts and feelings that were so intense. And, um, and we saw the Baptist church split. We saw evangelism split. We survived the civil war, we as masons. Um, but it, it was a, a very iffy thing. It takes courage to be a dissenter unless you, de you devalue dissent itself. And that's what happened after the Civil War. You, one does not dissent anymore in this country uh, without running the risk of being humiliated and made a fool of. The people who are in the communities of faith, those who spoke up and said, uh, Donald Trump is, lacks simple common decency, how could we, uh, how could we uh, support him, were not supported by their own co-religionists. And that's not just about Trump, and it's not just about uh, politics. When Wells Fargo and General Motors both came before the Congress and admitted to supporting the, uh, a product that killed people, um, they, they said, thank you for letting me speak and goodbye. They went back to work and they were not punished. Accountability fled and we are in a sense obligated to show and illustrate accountability and the depth of how much we think it has damaged our children. We have eviscerated their, uh, their education and we act as if we hate them and we don't. We're being led by foolishness. Brother Richard, thank you. The motto uh, of the United States in Latin uh, is a pluribus uh, unum, out of many, one. Uh, this motto requires serious contemplation. Speaking of which, 
we are joined by brother Chuck Dunning of Texas, the author of the book, Contemplative Masonry. Brother Chuck, the floor is yours. Thank you, Brother Akram and um, Brother Dreyfus. It's a pleasure to speak with you this evening. I've listened carefully to the things that you've said. I've been struck in particular by your comment uh, about how television can put us in a trance. And you've also talked about how uh, human beings are often regarded as cattle and often behave as cattle. Um, and by contrast, Masonry teaches us the importance of being contemplative, introspective, and reflective. So I'm wondering how you see these practices as relevant to good citizenship and well-being um, as a country. That's a great question. And I think uh, one of the things that we can do is to realize that public education should not be limited to, let's say, Western subjects, but there can be, without a doubt, um, the teachings that encourage meditation and um, uh, the quiet that is necessary to look inside and um, make friends with yourself. The only companion that you will have until the moment you die is yourself. And that self must be friendly to you and friendly to the development of the principles that allow for uh, someone to learn to trust their own sense of right against someone's sense of wrong. Just now, I was on a, gr a group um, a Zoom where they were talking about the, de the devilish uh, powers of social media. And I said uh, to myself as I watched that they didn't realize that social media um, creates a parody, a parody of equality between the worst kind of trash thinking and the best. And that is something that we should all stop and think on how to solve. We believe that our children cannot concentrate for more than a few seconds. And that's simply a lie by the advertisers who are trying to convince the broadcasters to give them more time uh, to advertise. And we unfortunately have parents all over the country who didn't have civics and their parents didn't have civics. 50 years of the lack of civics has confused the most important issue, which is, as George Washington put it, the Constitution must always be central and the factions must always be peripheral. And now we are living in its exact opposite. And there's no way that factions can remain uh, steady, purposeful, and unchanging. And the Constitution of the United States is built as a work in progress, and its changeability is deep and fundamental in its definition. No one knows this because no one knows the Constitution anymore. This is something that happened in the face of all reason. And since common sense was, a, you know, named by Tom Paine, because senselessness had been the only overriding passion of the human race. And now we are returning to it as we return to the Stockholm Syndrome. We are falling in love with senseless and cruel behavior. We want to go there again because it, it makes our head hurt, common sense and adultery and adulthood. It makes us uh, fear. Well, I'd rather trust the people who are raised 
within the Masonic ideals and the constitution and the bill of rights and not caste, class, uh, state religion. No, 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 no. We are better and smarter than that. But we have to be active. And one has to remember and act on that memory that, that comes about when you realize that sense is better than nonsense. And senselessness is not better than common sense. Thank you. Thank you again, uh, Brother Richard. Um, we also are, are joined uh, today by, uh, by Brother Brad Drew from the state of Kentucky. Brother Brad has conducted a number of training workshops with the Masonic Legacy Society. So Brother Brad, the floor is yours. Thank you, Brother Akram, and thank you, Brother Richard, for your time tonight. Um, now, obviously, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know when I say that the last 18 months have been especially challenging for all of us in one way or another. Uh, we've often been pushed outside of our comfort zones and asked to think differently, um, whether it be locally in our own communities, regionally throughout our states or across the nation, we're continuing to witness actual change in our society. And more often than not, that change has created stress and confusion. Uh, so my question for you this evening is, how does one find balance and harmony between the exercise of our own individual rights and the rights of others? That's great. I just finished a book about the great dissenter who was Har uh, Judge Harlan on the Supreme Court, Harlan Stone, and he was from Kentucky. And he was a perfect Kentuckian. Um, if you had anything to do or have uh, with um, Henry Clay's uh, Institute for Negotiation and Compromise. Um, you know why I think of uh, Kentucky as a great, great place that was cursed by trying to stay neutral and it became, by the end of the war, the worst place to live. Um, what, what we have to do is say we have a right and an obligation to speak what we know to be the truth, to speak in support of Republican democracy. The only way you can end up is to speak of it and not ban it from universities or schools. You have to speak of it. Right now, we know more about extremist Islam and uh, communism and socialism than we know about our own governance theory. And actually, the thing that should frighten everyone here in this room is that it has been out of the curriculum for 50 years and counting. And I'm 73 years old. And only the people older than me and my age exactly are the people who had a life experience of living within the Republican democracy. They, right now, the overwhelming majority of people only know it as some anecdote, as a tale. They never lived it. And that's going to make persuasion to fight for it harder. Someone who grew up as I did, and most of you did, uh, in, a, in breathing the atmosphere of freedom and the principles of liberty that the Masons so easily express. They have no idea, not from their own life. So it's actually quite frightening. Thank you again, uh, quite inspirational brother uh, Richard. We do know as Masons that Freemasonry introduced the concept of natural rights, which became enshrined in article one of the US Bill of Rights i.e. the First Amendment uh, to the U.S. Constitution. So with that, uh, at this time, uh, I will turn uh, again to Brother Len Proden, the SGIG of the Scottish Rite uh, of Washington, D.C. We always say the Scottish Rite is the place where one deepens one's knowledge uh, into the hidden symbolism of uh, Freemasonry. Brother Len, the floor is yours. Thank you, Akram. 
I'm glad to say to you, Brother Dreyfus, that I'm one year older than you, so I didn't realize until you pointed it out to me that I had experienced the learning and these freedoms and the principles, certainly, of liberty. So thank you for pointing that out, even though I am older than you. Uh, as a, a Scottish Rite Mason, uh, we go from the fourth degree to the 32nd, and we're often presented with, in each of those degrees, an obligation. And we either quietly repeat them or loudly repeat them, or we assent to them. But as a Scottish Rite Mason, a reoccurring theme comes through. And I, my question to you would be, as a Scottish Rite Mason, we have a specific obligation to conquer ignorance, avoid extremism, and defend tolerance. And how can you advise us on how we might fulfill those obligations in today's America? When I speak, and I speak often and to different groups, I say, you have already uh, compartmentalized me incorrectly. You think that I I'm a member of the, Holly, of the Hollywood gaggle of Hollywood liberals. I will say two things, the gaggle for no one. And I'm not a liberal. I am a libo, conservo, rado, middle of the rodo. Just like most of you, you just haven't given it enough thought lately. And anyone who votes a straight party ticket needs therapy. So, I think that what we are obligated to do is to rise above the pressures of partisanship and the pressures that lead us to give quick and glib and wrong answers. Most of civics is simply the learning of ways to communicate to people of opposing views. Most of civics is that. That means you must learn the context of things and you must learn that you don't have to spit at someone you disagree with. And the fact that we've actually reached a point where we have to say something like that means that we've actually achieved a level that we had never achieved. And uh, the first FCC chairman who was famous for saying that television was a vast wasteland. He also said the, con the concept, the problem with the concept of the lowest common denominator is that there's no such thing as the lowest. And in some crazy way, we're in a contest to be dumber and stupider than the next guy. And as opposed to saying what are the great advantages of thinking well and clearly? What do I gain and my country gain from understanding this issue, not as I've been taught, but as I must know it? People who are not listening to the constitution think that by listening to their political party, they're doing something valuable. They're not. And we have to learn to teach our fundamentals so that we know why the Bill of Rights exists and exists in the fashion that it does. And we have to know why these issues are on the front page. I'm so happy that we have uh, uh, also with us Brother Mike uh, Jerzebek of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts where in 1773, Brother Paul Revere and members of the Sons of Liberty orchestrated the Boston Tea Party. So here you go, Brother Mike. Thank you, Brother Akram. And uh, good evening, Brother Dreyfus. Freedom is a concept that transcends classifications. It can be physical, emotional, intellectual, or spiritual. It can be described as an internal, an external, or a communal condition. But what I'm really interested in hearing from you tonight is what freedom means to you. You always save the, the really simple questions for the latter part of the experience. Okay, um, what freedom means to me. I, 
uh, am not, I have no shame or embarrassment when I say that I love my country and I love the ideas my country has come to represent. I have not a, a wit of, of uh, shyness about saying it. I'm a kiss the tarmac American. And I can happily tell you that my son, who was the epitome of cynicism until very recently, told me, Dad, I have become a kiss the tarmac American. He was, an, he is an editor of Mother Jones magazine and they credit him with it winning the best magazine award. What freedom is, is the allowance and encouragement for the human brain to seek and become the best it can possibly be and to accept the responsibilities that shape freedom from being license and chaos. And when we know that the difference between freedom and the hysteria of crowds is only that much, and it's based upon what one teaches the young, we have a better and bigger idea of the responsibility of teaching the young anything at all about the American birth tale or anything else. We think, we think that the Boston Tea Party, for instance, was a, a spontaneous act of, of uh, the exercise of don't push me around, Uncle George, when in reality it was a staged affair and it was actually a misunderstanding that was taken advantage of by some of the founders who said, let's not tell them that it's a gift from the uh, East India Company and they're giving us this all the tea for free. Let's just say we don't want to be trod on. And they, they turned the Boston, Bostonians into a crowd of mass hysteria. And it's what you learn when you learn critical thinking. And critical thinking is the only thing that you, one must have emotional maturity to exercise. You have to be a grown up to critique your own. And I've been reading American history forever. I've always seen things that I could say were shameful sins. And I've always seen things that I was intensely proud of. That is not the point. The point is that you can learn all of that and it informs your sense of citizens' responsibilities. And it informs the, the kind of hedonistic pleasure you get from knowing and understanding and connecting more. When I was 19, I was a conscientious objector to the war in Vietnam. And I went and uh, I spent two years on the midnight shift at LA County Hospital. And I discovered what I called from then on the splendid pleasure of seeing my brain enlarge. And for me, freedom is that ability, that right. No one could or should ever tell a child or anyone else that he shouldn't learn. The more one learns, the more one is. And I didn't understand when I was in high school why we took the subjects we took. But right after high school, I understood it all. Because if you have art, art informs history and your sense of yourself. If you have music and drama, if you have 
a class that teaches you how to take apart a 1983 Chevy. You learn teamwork and you learn innovation and creativity. You learn to love learning. The mistake, the mistakes of education are vast. And one that is always uh, seized upon is we think that we should teach our children what to think as opposed to how to think. And when we express a lack of trust in our children, we are not following any Masonic uh, ideals that I'm aware of. And I, I would think that we all have to stand up as Masons and say, is there a dime's worth of difference between Masonic ideals and the American Constitution and, and its Bill of Rights? Is there any important difference between being a Mason and being an American? And I think that's the great discovery that Masons have been here for a thousand years and they've kept secret the fact that they are the beau ideal of our principles. Thank you, uh, Brother Richard. Abraham Lincoln, you know, in his uh, Gettysburg Address, we here highly resolve that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. So I now turn to Illinois, the land of Lincoln, where Brother RJ will ask the final question. Thank you, Brother Akram. Thank you, Brother Dreyfus, for, for all of the insights so far this evening. Uh, Brother Richard, here we are at the precipice of, of a monumental occasion, one that stands to the world as a testament and a proof that this great experiment worked. Uh, this idea of individual freedoms wasn't a fad. The Masonic fraternity has been here since the beginning, offers its wisdom, uh, offering its tenets, its virtues to the ever-evolving and, and progressive uh, idea that's been manifested or made real. Given our Masonic history in America, the year 2026 is the 250th anniversary of America. What can or should Masons do over the next five years in preparation for that? Every American in every state should make uh, certain that they in, put themselves in front of the whatever committees of education there are in that state and seek out the argument that they have to keep it on such and such a level. There was a question that actually was invented while I was in school. And everyone thinks that it was a question that's older than that, but it's not. And the question was, how much public money should be spent on public schools? And no one realized that that was the very first time anyone had ever asked that question because it always had been known its answer, which was, whatever it takes. And when someone offered that as an answer, they were told by their own school boards, no, that's impossible. That's not an answer. And you have to give me a budget number. And they did it. And they were always told too much, whatever it was. As if there was something more important than the brains of our progeny and the, the possibility that we're, we were not going to be up to it, that we were not going to be as smart as we should be in being the sovereign power here. And then we did everything possible to guarantee that ignorance. We have to 
as Masons and as Americans, and certainly as parents and teachers. You have to engage your representatives and remind them that they work for us, not the other way around, that they should not have pension plans and health insurance, et cetera, that is better than the people who put them in office. That is a development that should never have taken place. We run this country. We, in that meaningful phrase, we the people are the sovereign power. There is no class and no caste and no common religion. There is nothing but the ideas of the enlightenment and those ideas, if not taught to every separate generation, creates what could only be compared to a balloon that is untethered in the Macy's Day Parade. It looks as if it can be stopped and gathered if we only just spent the effort. And we didn't, and it drifted away and we're paying the piper. There is no partisanship in what I say. And when you hear, as I did, the editorial uh, board of the Wall Street Journal tell me that there was a hidden agenda in the teaching of civics, I realized these people were nuts. And anyone, and by the way, I say everyone, when I finally went to Washington, I had spoken in front of 200,000 people over 15 years. Not one of them, not one person disagreed with the absolute necessity of teaching the young the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And we teach them the young, teach the young because you can teach through love and affection. You can't do that later on. And so when the Wall Street Journal said to me that there was a hidden agenda in the teaching of civics, I said, anywhere, any place, any time, I will debate that issue with you and I will prove you wrong. There's no such thing as teaching a, slant, a slanted version. And we should be above our partisanship, not overwhelmed by it. And it's incredibly important that people realize that I'm not asking this as a liberal or as a Democrat or as a Republican or as a conservative. I'm asking it for America, which right now is acting from an end game. We are within 20 or 30 years of there not being America. There may be a country called the United States of America, but it will not be that country that puts itself on the principles of the Masons and stands comfortably on it. It will be at war with the Masonic ideal. And that's what we have to watch out. Thank you, uh, uh, Brother Richard. Uh, man, we can go on forever, but I know our time uh, is uh, is coming to, to an end. So before, before we close this, uh, a uh, wonderful conversation uh, with Brother Richard. I uh, want to turn to uh, Len. Uh, would you like to say a few words uh, in closing? I think we met our purpose uh, in, for today's activity. Certainly, it was to be a learning activity in celebration of Constitution Day. In my opinion, we've certainly done that. What we do with civics and civic engagement and where we go from here and how becomes probably the issue of what are we going to do from a Masonic perspective and how are we going to approach this? The only thing that I would add, because we've heard some uh, provocative ideas, some provocative opinions, and, and certainly uh, 
having spent 44 years in public education, dealing with our, our young is certainly important. But I think we also, as Masons, might have an obligation to our adults. If they've missed and there's this void, as Brother Dreyfus has indicated, it's still not too, I guess, uh, difficult to teach an old dog new tricks. And so maybe that might be able to occur too. And uh, I'll say no more, except I know Akram will do some acknowledgements, but I just want to say one to him and he'll leave himself out. But he's the catalyst that made this work. Thank you, Akram. I certainly appreciate just as this panel does and Brother Dreyfus for all your efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, Len. And yes, uh, I do have, uh, before closing, uh, bringing this webinar to a close, uh, let me first express uh, my sincere thanks uh, to the DC Scottish Rite uh, for its support of the Masonic Legacy Society's workshops and for co-hosting this program. Our thanks also go to the Supreme Council of the Scottish Rite for providing the Zoom webinar platform along with behind the scene logistical and technical support. Thank you, brethren at the House of the Temple, the Supreme Council, much appreciated. Um, you know, brethren, this was the purpose of our conversation today is we asked Brother Dreyfus to, to share with us his own perspective. I mean, and that is what Freemasonry teaches us. Each and every one of us is supposed to speculate, uh, to speculate on the deeper meaning of freedom. You know, what does relief mean uh, to us? You know, what is brotherly love? You know, seeking the truth. And the more free individuals, truly free individuals we have and freedom from from ignorance, freedom from extremism, like Brother Len mentioned, you know, freedom from tyranny, not simply freedom to do things, but freedom from those things that shackle our minds, you know, and, and, and enslave us, and knee-jerk reactions, etc. So the more free individuals we have, the greater the possibility of living the sovereignty of the people that Brother Richard was talking about. So today's, here's what I want to say to us, Today's generation of Americans must rise to the challenge as did previous ones in the past. But for us, our generation of Freemasons, we have a rendezvous with destiny in just about five years. This goes very, very fast. And on this Constitution Day, let us renew our Masonic obligations and get to work in the quarries of the great experiment. Let us use the tools of our craft to lay out constructive designs on our respective trestle boards. So thank you very much. And, and Brother Richard, thank you so much for uh, your insights. And we have something we tip in many of us Freemasons know. So I'm going to use that to close. Happy to meet, sorry to part, but happy to meet again. Please visit Masonic Legacy Society 2026.com or simply MLS2026.com. Never forget 2026. Thank you so much.